Thank you. It's an honor to be here in the presence of this uh, court, which is looking into a very important humanitarian matter and shedding light on some points and issues that uh, the public has to know. First of all, I will introduce myself. I'm Maria Marwan Laish. I'm 66 years old, Syrian, and an engineer. I worked in the public sector at the beginning, and then I moved to the, uh, to the private sector in the commerce. My political affiliations are that I'm a liberal person, I'm independent, I believe in democracy for Syria. However, I paid the price for my beliefs, because in Syria we are not allowed to think about democracy. Esteemed judges, I would like to tell you briefly a, a, a small uh, political introduction about the situation in Syria. Yesterday, journalist Hala talked uh, in detail about it. However, she said that the uh, movement in Syria or the history of the movement in Syria started in March 2011. However, this is not complete. At the beginning, Syria got its independence in 1946. From 1946 until 1958, 12 years, there was a, a Suri, Syrian bourgeoisie. There were uh, 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 there were magazines, uh, newspapers, and others. There was independent uh, media. However, with uh, uh, the nationalistic uh, current in Syria, and in 1963, this vision changed. The structure of the society changed, and everything changed because because of the emergency law that was declared on uh, 8 March uh, 1963. And then the Ba'ath uh, coup um, is, uh, started, uh, like it was launched, and it's similar to other revolutions, other coups that, uh, and it led to dictatorship. It did not lead to building a progressive or democratic society. Uh, that is despite of uh, the slogan of uh, this uh, party, unity, freedom, and uh, uh, we're living together. However, they built a totalitarian regime starting 1963. The military were in charge of Syria, were in control of Syria. They marginalized uh, the people, they marginalized the political elite, they marginalized all syndicates and all journalists. So on 8 March 1963, the repression started in Syria. And then we will move from 1963 until 1970. So we had seven years that led to uh, the coup of Hafez al-Assad. So he uh, did the coup against uh, the, his, the regime and the society. And he established a dictatorship, a terror dictatorship, based on intelligence services, repress, uh, op oppression, repression, and not given cit giving citizens any rights. In this nation, you do not have any rights. You have to work and to produce enough for you and to serve the plan of the state. It's uh, based on the Stalin, Ceausescu, and Mao. He followed the example of these. These are his spiritual fathers. So he built the kingdom of silence, the kingdom of terror, and the kingdom of and the republic of uh, failure. Ceausescu, he followed the steps of Ceausescu and uh, built Syria. He built Syria also based on uh, a security uh, example and based also on the, the Chinese Maui and uh, the uh, extremism that th he had in, in his way. So all these qualities uh, made people respect him on the surface. However, Syrians, deep inside, they don't respect this because it did not give them any uh, possibility to growth, of natural growth. What happened in Syria was a very slow growth. However, if, uh, for example, if he builds, built a school or uh, m built a street, uh, they celebrate it as a great achievement. However, they decided to forget this, the, the, the long history of Syria the, about, um, over thousands of years with a great culture and heritage. Everything was put on a halt in 19, uh, on 8 March 1963, and this was deepened by Hafez al-Assad. 
Starting in 1970, parties were banned, uh, newspapers were banned, uh, expressing our uh, our opinions was banned, uh, and there was the uh, all the Syrians were repressed. Syria has 16 confessions, ethnicities, and religious groups. Syria is diversity. Syria lived 1,400 years without any conflicts. There was not even a civil war. There was no fight between Syrians. Never. This has never happened among uh, in the entire history. Maybe there were some uh, small incidents uh, under the Ottomans. However, uh, Syria after uh, 1963 and 1970 is a new Syria compared to our history. Since 1970 and in 1975, secret parties were established. Syrian opposition is not similar to opposition in Europe. Syrian opposition does not have any rights. Uh, European opposition participates in the parliament and in, the, and in public life. Syrian opposition is oppressed and they are not allowed to express their opinion. If we uh, distribute uh, the uh, magazine or a secret, um, uh, if we distribute any magazines or newspapers related to these secret parties, we would be sentenced to 10 years in prisons. One of my colleagues, who is a communist, was uh, imprisoned for 10 years because he was distributing a party newspaper. So all this created uh, some sort of revolution inside the people. So this oppression and this v violence and this military dictatorship was reflected in uh, and stayed inside the Syrians who were not able to do anything. In 1963, when the Ba'ath uh, took control, uh, the first resistance started in 1964. Some civilians uh, rose against uh, the, the measures of uh, the Ba'ath and uh, against the, the policies of nationalizing the society. However, uh, so in 1964, a small movement was established that was fighting a dictatorship. However, this uh, faded, and then we reached the 80s. In the 80s, and unfortunately, the society was, uh, um, was fed up with this oligarchy, with this group that is controlling Syrian people and giving them the crumbs of uh, their resources at a time when the elites are living in their palaces and, they, uh, and they're living outside of Syria or taking their money out of Syria. In the 80s, the Syrian people was uh, repressed because of the movement of one religious uh, group, which is the Muslim Brothers, uh, composed of uh, three to 4,000 uh, members. They started as a uh, civilian uh, movement and then uh, to, uh, it turned into a military uh, movement. So Hafez al-Assad mobilized the entire country to fight and to, uh, to fight them. So these 4,000... So Hafez al-Assad did not only arrest these 4,000 people, but he arrested the entire society through his security apparatus, the, the military, the army, the special forces. And all these were just executing his desires. So he confiscating the society, the entire society, and came up with the slogans, Hafez uh, forever. So he became uh, like a god who was worshipped by his uh, security apparatus. And the, the word Hafez was being memorized by children when they, are born, when they are very young. So when a child is six years old, he should go to a children organization belonging to al Ba'ath. And then they have to move to the uh, young, the, the cubs. Um, and then they have to move to the, um, to the Ba'ath party and then to the um, military. So they are brainwashed. So Hafez erased the entire uh, history of Syria, all the culture uh, from uh, uh, very historical poets and scientists. He erased everything and kept everything for himself. He wanted to be the god, the dictatorship who is a god. In such a society, this is not normal. The Syrians had to rise. Hafez died, Hafez al-Assad died in 2000. Unfortunately, the political elites uh, related to this family and related to him decided to uh, give the power to his son. 
So it became like a monarchy and not a republic. In a, in a republic, uh, the power is not inherited, but this happened in Syria. So the Syrians became a bit optimistic that the repression period of Hafez al-Assad throughout 30 years, uh, this very long 30 years, uh, they thought that this period is over with the, uh, when uh, a young person called Bashar came and he's, he was an ophthalmologist who studied in uh, the UK and for two years. So he was supposed to be an educated person who have lived in the West and learned the values of the West. So probably he was uh, influenced by these values. However, we reaped uh, the negative, uh, uh, the negative, uh, the negative impact of the UK on him. He was hosted in the UK and he witnessed the democratic values and the respect of citizens uh, over there. However, when he came to Syria, he uh, came with an iron fist. When his father died and uh, uh, some uh, uh, princes from the Gulf, uh, he told them, don't think that this is my hand when he extended his hand to them. He said, don't think that this is my hand. This is my an iron hand or an iron fist. So the Syrians were optimistic, and I was one of them, that an op a window to go out of uh, Hafez's dictatorship is open. So from uh, we, we uh, the Syrian people, the journalists, the syndicates, and uh, everyone, uh, were all uh, we were all unofficial and uh, only on uh, based on our personal uh, status. We were not allowed to meet or to be an organization. So we have to work within the field that the regime give, has given us. We cannot le work outside of it. So we thought that a window was open. We have a new young president, and we were optimistic. We thought that he is different from his father. So we thought that we have to cooperate with him in order to move Syria towards a more advanced uh, phase, to build a democracy, and not to continue with the totalitarian uh, regime, uh, with the violence and uh, depriving people from their rights. So, and then a movement called the Spring of Damascus uh, was established, and so they said that this is a new president and he will allow us to work. So they established uh, the um, Riyadh Safe Forum, uh, the Badra Khan uh, Forum in Hasake, and other uh, fora in Hasake and Aleppo and other areas of the country. So these people felt comfortable, and I was one of them. I thought, I thought that there was no arrest, there was no violence. Suddenly, so we're talking about the July 2000, three months after that, we were informed that we were not allowed to uh, gather because these fora were illegal. And then they started with a, an arrest campaign against everyone who participated in uh, the fora. They arrested uh, Habib Isa, their colleagues, uh, Fawaz Kello, and others. So they arrested 10 people, and uh, they considered them as the leaders of the media. They considered them as the leaders of the Spring of Damascus. So they sentenced them to five years, ex ex except for Adel Dalile, who was sentenced for 10 years, and there were reasons for this. So they uh, repressed uh, the um, uh, dialogue based on uh, culture and building the new uh, Syrian identity or nationalist identity. However, this spirit of uh, a democratic change uh, remained. and. In 2005, I joined the Damascus Declaration project for Syrian nationalists from secular people, from independent people, and from the, the illuminated people. So uh, we did this uh, Damascus Declaration. So the Syrian democratic change. Our slogan. So our slogan in this declaration was. Democratic, Syrian democratic change that is safe, calm, and progressive, and not a coup. So we wanted to cooperate with all Syrian forces, all Syrian factions, all Syrian parties, and all the ethnic components of the Syrian society in order to establish a new political body for the state. We also uh, convened a meeting in Damascus on the 30th of December 2007, and a few days later, uh, so the meeting extended over th a few days, and then the response was, these people, these 12 people, four doctors, three journalists, two engineers, and an artist, 
and two other two female doctors, Miss Horani, who is this, the daughter of uh, another politician, and the other person who is Yasser Aiti. You can see their uh, photos on the screen. We have also Fayez Sara, we have Hamahaji Darwish. And under the lady, uh, Ms. Fida, there is uh, uh, Akram al-Binni, uh, then Dr. al-Binni, Mr. Shufi, and then Ali Abdullah, who is a journalist. And then we have Ahmad Tami, then we have Marwan al then uh, Mr. Saif, who is very well known. And then we have the artist Talal. So all these 12 people were the leaders of the Damascus Declaration. They were uh, calling for nationalistic uh, spirit, for democracy, to build a modern state and not to continue under the uh, slogan so we wanted a safe, uh, progressive, calm, democratic change. What do you want better than such a slogan? So what does the people want other than this? However, we met and a national council was elected and 189 uh, Syrian figures attended this meeting from all uh, ethnicities and they uh, issued this declaration, which is the, uh, the Damascus Declaration. The regime did not like this. They, how would we call for uh, a change? And this change is an attack, is, is trying to remove the regime. But what we meant is uh, trying to build a citizen, a state of citizens, a nationalistic state that embraces diversity. This is what we want as a democratic state. But however, what happened? These 12 people, us, all these 12 people were arrested we were uh, put in the intelligence uh, headquarters uh, for two months with torture. The third person uh, is Mr. Faiz Sara. He was he beaten in front of us. His screaming and his moans reached the entire building, filled the entire building. The, Ali Abdullah also and others. So they used violence against us. They used the atrocious ways to torture us for we had two months of psychological and uh, physical torture, and they wanted us to retract this uh, declaration. However, we held on, uh, held on, held on, held on tight, and then we were uh, sent to a court. Usually, we would be uh, sent to a uh, extraordinary uh, court uh, or the, the military field court. However, since uh, we had a lot of uh, relations and connections with European uh, people. Uh, the French president uh, and uh, the uh, speaker of the Irish parliament and some members of the European parliament, they all interfered and through them we were able to move from the military, from military court to a civilian court and we were tried before a civilian court, Syrian civilian court. We had a defense and uh, with the presence of, uh, uh, with, of uh, uh, figures, prominent figures. Uh, so lots of people volunteered to defend us, among them uh, Khalil Ma'atouk, Mr. Mazen, and he is uh, disappeared, forcefully disappeared, among others. So there were 17 democratic Syrian uh, lawyers who defended us. So, at the beginning, they uh, uh, sentenced us to 15 years of prison inside Naya. However, the interference of the Europeans and uh, Syria, Syria was uh, trying to sign some agreements with, the, the, uh, uh, with the, some European countries. So, they, uh, they gave us only 30 months uh, as a jail uh, sentence, and we were moved to Adra prison, which is a civilian prison, up on, uh, in 2008. So we spent 2008, 2009, and 2010 in the prison. I was released in July 2010. My colleagues uh, were released either before me or after me, depending on the date of the detention. And during the, the imprisonment, so it was a civilian prison and not a military prison, so it was not like Said Naya prison. In Said Naya, you would stay in one room for 10 years. So one, one room for 10 years, one cell. It's 40 centimeters by 40 centimeters. This is the quota of a Syrian a citizen in military uh, prisons such as the Palmyra prison and the Said Naya prisons others. So 40 by 40 centimeters. 
uh, you get one piece of potato or two olives or one piece of bread only per day. And uh, during uh, some time, uh, some of our colleagues in Palmyra prison, they spent three months without bread. They were denied bread. This is what the uh, head of the prison uh, wanted. And the heads of the prisons were like uh, gods. The head of the Sidnaya prison was also like a god. So they did not discriminate whether you are a, a journalist, a doctor, a normal uh, citizen. Everyone was oppressed, everyone was repressed, and they, everyone was dealt with in the same way, uh, humiliated and with violence. So I was uh, released from prison in July 2010. And that was nine months before the uh, revolution. During the imprisonment, we were debating a lot. So since it's a civilian uh, prison, we would meet with our colleagues and we receive visits. So uh, so the late uh, Mashad Kilo, may God, uh, may his soul rest in peace, and others were detained before us, over, Miss like Anwar al-Binni, uh, Habib Isa, and others. So they had all signed the, the Damascus Declaration so we used to meet some of them in prison and we used to debate how we can change this country. So we were debating where is Syria headed and we were wondering why this violence, why this uh, psychological terrorism um, and why doesn't Syria take, take the steps of uh, advancement and development. We want a democracy like Mauritania and like Malaysia. We want a democracy just like any other uh, democracies in our country, such as Turkey, Indonesia, Malaysia. And unfortunately, Arab countries cannot be taken as examples uh, for democracy. There were some democracies, such as in Mauritania, but we were wondering, when will these people rise? That was when we were in prison. So these men, these 12 men, <coughs> were all trying to look for solutions for Syria. They were trying to look for solutions for the Syrian people and the Syrian nation, not uh, military coup and not uh, terrorist terrorist uh, solutions. Not, uh, but we were. They were trying to find solutions with um, uh, logic uh, and with a humanitarian point of view. However. The regime did not respond to us. It's closed. It's the kingdom of silence. The regime is like a god. You have you have this road. You have to walk this road. If you go uh, out of this road, you are killed. Whether they are Islamists, Christians, or other uh, or other religions, whether you have you are a socialist or a communist, everyone was being arrested. No one was protected. No one was above this. Everyone was subject to detention. She was released in July 2010. And what what had changed in Syria then? from the time you were in prison and they precipitated the uprise in 2011. So as I said, we were in prison and we were uh, meeting and uh, talking with our colleagues through windows, through uh, water pipes from a room to another. We were talking through uh, water pipes from a toilet to a toilet. This is how we were communicating. We were, were communicating uh, through a small hole, like a window. And sometimes I used to meet some people through uh, visits. I met with Mazen uh, uh, in a visit uh, through a net. Nothing changed during our presence uh, in prison. The regime did not change. There was no advancement. There was no steps towards any uh, political uh, transformation. There was no, no social change. So all this exploded on the 15th of March. Uh, that was the, the starting point. The Syrians exploded when they heard about the, the um, Arab Spring in Tunisia, when uh, Ben Ali fled, and in uh, Egypt, when uh, Hosni Mubarak left uh, and gave the power to a, a military council, and other, uh, other places also, then the killing of Gaddafi. So all these changes, all these changes happened, and we were just looking and we were watching. So 
and then came uh, the chant, where are you, my uh, Syrian citizens? This was the moment of the explosion of the Syrian people that, ga that ignited this was the this was what ignited the people the syrian people on 15 march uh, when a syrian woman this syrian woman young syrian woman called Nur al ghamian is the one who ignited this uh, this she carried the syrian uh, flag as my colleague said and stood in the middle of a, a square and said god syria and freedom so this woman and six other uh, university students. So the youth started the revolution and not us, and we give them this credit. These young people like Khulud, Hanan, and others such as Hosama as well, and Nabil Sharbaji, Yahya Sharbaji, and others from Damascus, the Reef of Damascus, and other cities, these are the ones who get the credit. They were one step ahead of us. Us as politicians, we failed because the regime made us fail. The regime does not want any partners in the power. What we wanted was to build a democratic state that uh, respects the human rights and respects humans. We are innovative people. We have doctors, we have engineers, we have uh, uh, thousands of uh, professions. However, everything was oppressed. All people wanted to be civil servants and get their salary, and that's it. The regime oppressed innovation. If you want to innovate, you have to pay the price. To the price. If you say no, you pay the price. If you want to bring new ideas, you are not allowed to do this. Madam Prosecutor, to answer your question, what changed compared to 2007 or since, uh, since, uh, what changed after my release from prison? A lot of thing, things changed. In prison, we learned. And then we saw that uh, things were boiling. So we saw that uh, the ideology of a revolution in Syria was starting started to boil, and was um, uh, that was before the 9th of uh, October 2010. There were repressed people in Syria. There's uh, the Jazeera area where there was drought and there was no work. The agriculture was damaged. There was only oil that was being extracted and uh, the, the money was going to the pockets of the political elite and not to serve the people. We have oil, we have gas, we have natural resources, we have agriculture, we have wheat. We used to produce 3 million tons of wheat uh, per year and now we barely produce 100,000 tons of wheat. So I wanted uh, to paint this clear picture. Uh, the woman yesterday said that Syrians started thinking about this in 2011. No, they started thinking about this in March 1963, about how to resist uh, the system that came uh, with guns, with tanks, uh, with dictatorship, uh, just like fascism, unfortunately. These military men have a, an average uh, education. Uh, they uh, just go to military college after getting their high school degree. They don't have a high, uh, high education degree, so they have limited education. And then they carry weapons, uh, they carry missiles, tanks, uh, and other uh, heavy weapons. But this uh, created uh, like a lack of or a complex, complex of inferiority um, among soldiers and military men. I am proud of being Syrian and the uh, military should be Syrian, citizens uh, should be Syrians. The Syrians lived uh, 1,400 years with coexistence. Uh, so we arrived to the morning of March 15th. Okay, now I will move to the morning of uh, March 15th. Nur al-Ghamian and college students uh, went to uh, the Umayyad Mosque. They went to the Hamidiya Souk, which is the biggest and most famous souk in Dem uh, Damascus. They called for de de democracy, change, freedoms. However, the regime, the party, and a lot uh, of uh, people were still chanting uh, uh, God, Syria, and uh, Bashar. Bashar, at the end of the day, is a human being. Why are you chanting for Bashar? Call for democracy, call for change, call for uh, growth, uh, democracy, without uh, useless uh, slogans. So we reached the morning of March 15th. 
in Damascus, people rose and uh, people rose in other provinces uh, the days later. On March 16th, uh, mentioned by my the day mentioned by my colleagues. Actually, I was released from, from prison in July 2010, well, like, but my colleagues were still in prison. Ali al-Abdullah was also sent, sentenced to uh, two years and a half because he published an article against al-Khomeini and the elections in Iran. While he was in prison, he wrote an article, Mr. Ali Abdullah Abu Hussein, and he sent it to a Lebanese newspaper. He was sentenced for an additional year. He already had two years and a half, so then he was sentenced by a military court for an additional year in jail. Mohanad al Hassani, also the uh, famous Human Rights Watch lawyer, Haytham al Malah, uh, the famous uh, legal experts, and many others stayed in jail. On March uh, 15, the people couldn't take it anymore, and the revolution was ignited. The uh, human rights organizations in Syria and the families of detainees decided to gather and to stand in front of the Ministry of Interior on 16 March 2011 at noon, calling on the um, minister to uh, to, ch to um, uh, establish a change because they were on a hunger strike uh, in jail. And just like my colleagues uh, said. Uh, I was standing with Mr. Faisal and Fawaz Dillo in a location, and then Maymuna, Nabil Sharbaji, Osama Nassar, and Yahya Sharbaji were right next to us. Uh, suddenly, we saw microphones, uh, small buses, uh, fro uh, and then uh, uh, security guys um, came from these buses uh, and started beating uh, everyone with sticks. So because we were carrying the uh, photos of detainees, they started uh, with us and then they moved to other people. So some groups were uh, at the northern part of the square. We were at in the eastern part of the square. Maimuna, Osama, Yahya and Nabil were standing there. And then suddenly security forces uh, started uh, uh, taking them to specific location in order to detain them. They didn't come at us because they know that we are politicians. So they started with the young people. They started detaining them. And just like Mr. Osama said, and just like uh, my other colleagues said, this affected us immediately. Of course, Osama was detained with Mrs. Suhair Atassi. She is a relative uh, uh, to the previous uh, president. Uh, he's, she, she's an activist, Dr. Tizini. He's a doctor in the Damascus University, a philosophy uh, um, doctor. So they detained 32 or 33 people for a little while, and then they released them. Nabil. Okay, during the March 16th events in Damascus? Yes, Mr. Usama introduced me to uh, Nabil. Uh, so my brother, Usa I used to know my brother Usama before I knew Nabil. So when I, released, when I was released from jail, Mr. Usama um, and our also our friend who died uh, recently, the uh, moderate Sheikh Jaudat Said, he came with Osama and some friends. They visited me in jail and they visited me in my house when I was released in order uh, to see how I was doing. And then uh, I was introduced. Uh, I was introduced uh, by them to uh, Nabil. They all call, f call for uh, freedoms, democracy, and change in Syria. On the day of the demonstration, Osama introduced me to Nabil. We talked uh, until the security forces came to arrest them. This was my first meeting. Okay. Were you arrested in 2011? No. On that day, 
we were under surve surveillance. When a prisoner is released from jail, he is under surveillance. And then each month, he would be called uh, in order to testify. Uh, uh, and they would surveil everything we would write on the internet. There was one officer uh, designated for me uh, to uh, surveil what I was doing. This applied to all of my colleagues. But on the 1st of February 2011, so before March 2011, the security apparatus or the state security intelligence branch in Damascus called us and told us, you are politicians. However, those who are in Tunisia, Egypt, and Libya rose. So are you going to do the same against our regime? We said if the conditions, the right conditions are there, as politicians, yes, we will rise. We have demands. We want the emergency law that was established 40 years ago to be lifted. We want a modern law to allow the establishment of parties. Uh, there, uh, there was no such law in uh, Syria. The opposition uh, uh, parties, or what they call opposition parties, were not like uh, regular European opposition uh, parties. They were not really taken into consideration. So he, he told us, don't you dare go to the streets, because we have information that there are Israelis who will infiltrate into your protests and kill you. I am being very honest with you here, I swear. It's very good to understand where all the resisting sectors were from the time you met these youth, uh, Nabil and other younger professionals engaging in these activities. What was your role? How did you engage in what will happen? I mean, we, we can take it through 2011 and until the arrest, that was the final one of Nabil. Were you working with them? What was your relationship with this team, the, the Daraya group? The Daraya group uh, is comprised of diverse, uh, young, peaceful people that b who believe, just like us as politicians, in democratic change. However, previously they were already rep repressed and they had detained them and put them in the Sidnaya jail, so they were a bit cautious. However, uh, uh, my, my politician colleagues and I believe in the capacities of the youth. They are the future of Syria at the end of the day. So I communicated with, uh, I contacted Osama and the others, and I was made aware that they have a very promising uh, uh, program and project. Uh, Therefore, uh, in the Damascus uh, Declaration project, uh, I discussed with my colleagues uh, and we decided to open channels with them in order for us to merge maybe into one and become one group. At the end of the day, we want to build a nation that includes uh, women, uh, men, uh, sheikhs, uh, and everyone, uh, all segments of the society. So. I was the point of contact in order to talk to the uh, Mr. Osama's uh, with Mr. Osama's group and other groups in Daraya in as a peaceful democratic uh, movement uh, in Syria on the first year of revolution in the first year of revolution uh, no resident or protester held a gun However, Bashar al-Assad's uh, regime took a security uh, path uh, or solution when the protest happened in March, uh, April, uh, May. We used to go to Daraya, my, uh, my colleagues and I, we went and participated in the uh, uh, in the demonstrations in the in Daraya, in Duma, in Midan, in a, a lot of places. So every Friday, it used to be a, a very, it used to be a hot spot, uh, or it used to be important. Uh, not because it was a Friday and it's an important day in the Muslim culture, just like Sunday for Christians. 
but because the regime doesn't allow any associations in universities, in cultural centers, on the streets. But people could gather in the mosque in order to pray. Our colleagues who are Christians and who are from different confessions, they met with us in the mosques. So Arabs, Turks, Kurds, Christians, Muslims, Everyone and all confessions gathered in the mosque because they were allowed to gather uh, somehow in the mosque. Was this intentional or not? Uh, this was not uh, intentional. But as politicians, we had a relationship with the youth groups uh, in order to support them. They were one step ahead of us. They were the innovative ones. And unfortunately, we could not really contribute politically except uh, through international uh, relations and statements. In a slightly older generation, what will you say was the impact of the arrest in 2012 of someone like Nabil? Since we had experiences uh, in uh, detention uh, in 2008, and our colleagues also had this experience uh, before, communists were also detained uh, just like Muslims. Uh, Syrian communists uh, or a Syrian communist party, the political office uh, also that had an important place in the communist movement, they were also detained. The regime doesn't allow you to do anything uh, if you are with the right or with the left. Uh, so this had already affected us. And we know the experience. Uh, and we know what happens in jails. Uh, uh, humans are not respected. They are beaten. Uh, they are disfigurated. Uh, they get sick. Uh, I was one of the people who lost a kidney. Uh, uh, my kidney works at 10% uh, only due to the jail, uh, to prison. Uh, I only had one glass of water in 25, 24 hours, imagine, in the Special Forces Intelligence sector. Then I will talk to you about what happened in 2012. Uh, so we started having chronic diseases after that. Uh, so when we saw the, these uh, young men and women doing this, we uh, were scared for them. And we told them, be careful. Uh, despite this, they resisted. Uh, they also um, innovated uh, the women of Daraya also participated. Uh, if one uh, man is detained, 50 to 100 women would participate uh, in a, a sit-in uh, calling for his uh, release. Mrs. Khuloud Hilmi, uh, Mrs. Hanan uh, also testified, and there are a lot of stories. Uh, this is a revolution of a people, of an entire society, not only a revolution of men. Go ahead. Start again after your release in 2010? Yes. Due to my participation in protests in Damascus and its surroundings, on the 22nd of April and on the 21st of April 2011, I was in the Daraya protest. And that that day, I met Nabil Sharbaji for the second time. And he was just like a bird uh, holding his uh, camera and taking pictures. It was a great Friday. This was uh, a, this uh, is originally a, a Syrian Good Friday uh, uh, day for Muslims as well. Uh, this is when uh, Jesus uh, uh, Christ uh, died. So Syrians all celebrate Good Friday. It was an occasion for all Syrians to meet. Uh, on that day, I was outside of uh, Daraya. I came to Daraya at noon, and I saw young men uh, filling the street. Uh, there were uh, 4,000 to 5,000 people. They, were they wrote on a banner, 
peaceful, 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 we urged the police to protect the people. They were literally telling the police, don't arrest us, we are peaceful, we have demands. But what are our demands? They are basic human demands. We are asking for food that is not entrenched in blood. We also wanted freedoms, freedom of expression and association. On that day, 4,000 to 5,000 Daraya of Daraya residents and Damascus residents uh, took to the streets. Uh, Daraya is a very important uh, uh, area. It's a symbolic area, just like uh, Hama and other area. It has a lot of young people. Uh, Daraya is known for its uh, youth. Uh, Daraya. Uh, 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 Latakia and other uh, areas uh, are also very uh, symbolic. So when we got to the end of the street, the security forces uh, started coming to arrest. Mah Mahmoud Kholani is the first martyr who died in Daraya. 50 meters or 100 meters away, another person called Ammar, I don't remember his family name, was also killed uh, as a martyr. And then everything escalated. They were calling for a peaceful, uh, or they had peaceful demands, and they were faced with uh, rifles. Uh, Myself and my group and a lot of Syrians don't care who is in power and who governs us. I don't have a problem if it's Bashar or any other person. I just want him to be democratic. I want him to be just. I want him to allow freedom of expression, a, a peaceful political transition of power, having an op uh, allowing an, an opposition uh, or political parties that participate in free elections. Uh, in 40 years, all we witnessed was fraud in elections. And um, in addition to the repression of the security forces, if you say one word, uh, you would be held accountable. I wrote a lot of articles, but in 2003, uh, in Al Hiwar Al Mutamaddin, I wrote a lot of uh, uh, political and economic articles. Uh, my writings are on the internet. Then a security branch um, uh, called on me and they asked me, Why are you writing? You're an engineer. What does this word mean and what does this other word mean? You have nothing to do in politics. We are the politicians and you have nothing to do there. Syrians are not allowed to do any political um, activities or social activities. Uh, I was one of the, in one, a member of one of the uh, Syrian syndicates uh, and then I couldn't do this anymore because I asked for these basic demands. Thank you. Um, in what year? No. Uh, yes. So after the revolution, the city of Homs uh, and the Bab Amro neighborhood was attacked by the regime. Uh, there were peaceful activists that are demonstrating in Homs, and then the regime attacked them and detained some people. Therefore, people left this province. Uh, they were displaced. Uh, this happened uh, in July, August, September 2011. Uh, imagine we're in 2022 now. This was more than 10 years ago. This was uh, very early on, on 20 August 2012, just like what happened in um, Daraya, it, the same thing happened in Baba Amro in 2011. A lot of people left Hamas uh, and uh, came to Damascus. When I saw them, or I was standing somewhere, and then I noticed that there was a woman and uh, an 80-year-old man, maybe, with six children. I asked them, what are you doing here? They were scared, uh, and they didn't say a word. I told them, I'm a friend, don't worry, you can say what happened. They said, I am coming from Hamas. It's like Hamas is a, is a charge, an accusation by itself. Daraya was an accusation by itself, uh, Idlib as well. Uh, so let's say there are uh, 10 or 100 activists in Daraya, then the regime considers that the, all the residents of Daraya are against the regime uh, and traitors. So this... I saw this family at 9 p.m. in the cold. They didn't have anywhere to stay. 
I asked one of my, uh, I called one of my colleagues. I found an empty apartment. I brought them some blankets, uh, food, uh, drinks, uh, and clothes. So this is what used to happen. Uh, we would help families coming uh, from Homs. Uh, this was uh, only uh, done on a humanitarian basis. Uh, I had a friend called Omar Aziz. He was killed uh, as a martyr uh, in uh, prison with me. He is a doctor in political econom economics from a college in France. When he heard of the revolution in 2011, he left uh, uh, his work in uh, Paris One University and he came to Syria. Uh, Mr. Osama is aware of this, uh, but uh, he wanted to establish local councils in order for people to ask for their basic needs, hy uh, uh, hygiene, um, uh, water, uh, all these uh, basic uh, sanitation infrastructure. So we wanted uh, to help or he wrote a, pro a project asking for the establishment of local councils. It happened in Douma, then in Berze, then in Artus, uh, and then uh, the young people of uh, Daraya were asked to hold elections uh, and uh, a municipality, a head of municipality, in order to serve all of the citizens. This man, or the regime identified this man, and him and I were helping each other uh, on this project uh, and uh, on this paper. Therefore, uh, the regime uh, arrested him. He went to get his salary from one of the ATMs. Uh, he found a security patrol waiting for him. They detained him. They went to his house. They confiscated his computer, his money, uh, his belongings. Uh, and then they started to search for information uh, in his computer until they found my name in the computer. Uh, we had an account that had some money in order to help these associations to buy uh, tea, sugar, bread, and medications for those coming from uh, other provinces. These were donations from Syrian people, uh, Syrian citizens. There were like 1,000 or 2,000 euros that were designated for uh, helping those who are coming from other provinces. On the 23rd of November 2012, uh, they detained me. They raided my house. Uh, uh, they confiscated my uh, computer, my laptop. It was a Friday. Uh, they also confiscated uh, some money that I have in the house. He humiliated me and humiliated my family in front of me. He took me to the Air Force Intelligence Branch, and then I met uh, Omar Aziz over there. Uh, he was also killed as a martyr, um, or he died as a martyr because of the torture he was subje subject to. And for the first time, Contrary to all the other uh, um, detentions, I was uh, detained during the revolution twice. During a revolution, a revolution, detaining a person is different. Uh, the regime was really using unprecedented violence. When we were detained as part of Damascus uh, declaration, we uh, were slapped a few times and hit with a stick a, a few times. Uh, that's OK. But here, for huge men uh, were standing on my legs, uh, uh, sorry, on my arms, on my chest, and they wanted to, and uh, they wanted to kill me, suffocate me. Uh, there was a guy st also uh, who was ha uh, who was carrying a plastic uh, bat, and he wanted uh, to kill me. Another guy was also holding a laser, uh, a taser, sorry, and he was uh, trying to tase me. We spent 24 hours of constant torture. When I first went there, they put me in a solitary cell. Uh, so it was like uh, uh, two by one uh, meter. We were 16 people in this cell. There were 41 cells. 
from 1 to 41. Uh, number 7 and 9 were uh, specific for women. We were hearing their screams uh, for children and women. And then I was in cell number 34. Omar Aziz was in cell six, uh, 36. And we were being tortured 24 hours a day using uh, uh, tasers uh, and many different methods, uh, using wheels, use, using the German uh, chair. Uh, uh, we, uh, there were also children there, imagine. In my cell, there was a, a child from Deir Zor. He was 13 years old. Uh, so he was. they were torturing him just like they were torturing me. Did you with Mr. Nabil in Adra prison? And just see if you can relate a little bit your relationship. We're talking about in 2013. Tamam. I stayed two months in the Special Forces uh, Intelligence Branch. Then I was transferred to Adra prison, and, uh, and I was charged with uh, terrorism. The regime classified me as a terrorist. Uh, based on Law 19 uh, to, in 2012, uh, they established a, a terrorism law. They abolished the uh, emergency law, and then there was a terrorist law. So we were all considered uh, terrorists because uh, we dare to speak. I arrived to Adra prison on 13 February 2012. One month later, and because I was a previous detainee, I have experience with prisons. Even the police uh, knows me. Uh, they know my name. They knew that I was a troublemaker or uh, an opposition member. So, in the civil prison, there is a library. Unfortunately, this library didn't uh, include only dozens of books. In 2013, there were around 10,000 10, people. I have a friend who distributes bread. He has lists, so he used to distribute uh, a lot of bread. Uh, um, so he, uh, we counted the numbers and we concluded that there were 10,000 uh, um, people in prison. So I asked to go to the library. I can't, uh, I can't uh, just not read. Uh, since my detention, I read 50 books, uh, foreign and Arabic uh, books. Uh, so I met uh, with his colleagues in the library, Hani, Hussain, uh, and a lot of others. We used to meet at the library, and uh, we were um, uh, writing papers to each other. So we were trying to see how we can serve and help the others. We were in prison. I am assuring you that this happened in prison. If Mazen had 100 pounds and needs uh, needs to buy something, we would give it give it to another prisoner who did not have anything at all. So people would come to the to the prison with lice with uh, dermatologic dermatological diseases and some diarrhea and other uh, diseases so we were trying to help each other so for example if i had a visit uh, and i had uh, 100 pounds for example i would try to uh, get them uh, medication or try to get uh, some other people some uh, new underwear the, the situation was unimaginable so us people who had experience were trying to help the people, the newcomers. I was allowed to go to the library and I still have the library card. It's still with me and I can show it to you. So I have all the, the, the cards, the, the prison uh, card and others. I managed to bring them out of prison in uh, certain secret ways. So once when I was going to the library, because Every 20 to 4 hours, we are allowed to go out to a square outside to have a walk for two hours. It's like a two-hour break. The square of the uh, prison is there, and each uh, wing has one square. So at, uh, we have to we go from 11 until 1, and at 1, we return to our cells, and they lock the, the doors. And uh, the, the library opens two, two days per week, and I was, uh, I actually, I was allowed to go uh, to the library two days per week, and then I got a special permit to go three days per week to the library to read. So once when I was going in the corridor, the corridor, the corridor was, um, uh, was, um, was empty, and I had to walk in front of all the cells. 
So, in, there were nine wings of the, in this uh, prison, nine wings in this civil, civil prison, and each uh, wing has tens of, uh, dozens of uh, cells. And then, when I was going to the library, I saw Nabil in front of me. And he was, uh, I knew that he was detained in uh, February 2012. And then he met me and he, saw, he greeted me and asked me why I'm here. And then I, I asked him why he's here. He told me that he came from the Air Force Intelligence and they put us here. And he was hoping that they would not take them to Sidnaya. So I asked him, what do you want? He said, I, want, I need 500 pounds. So I give, gave him 500 pounds. So he told me that every time you, when you return inside, they bring us out to the um, square. So they are isolating us. So we don't meet us. So, the, so we can't meet each other. So uh, when people are, when the uh, intelligence is done with interrogating some people, they send them to civil prison for some time until they are moved to another prison. So they don't give them anything. So in prison, sometimes if you need to buy food, and uh, we, we have, you have to buy food, you have to buy it with your own money. And the government only provides non-sufficient uh, uh, meals. Uh, one slice of bread that is not even enough for one person is has to be divided by ten for ten people. So. He t uh, so Nabil told me that every day at 1.30 uh, he goes to the square. So I told him that every that three days per week I go to the library at 1.30 and I, I asked him what he wants. I told He told me that he needs clothes and he needs uh, bread and milk. Uh, uh, so how did we do? So there was a trash can uh, with a plastic bag. Uh, in one corner in the corridor. So I told him that I will put the, the, the these things in the trash ca trash can between the plastic bag and the can. So uh, so no one would see it. So I will pretend that I would be standing in front of the in front of the trash can to hide things. So he also the first thing he asked me was uh, newspapers. Because uh, civilian civilians were allow, uh, prisoners were allowed to bring in newspapers to read newspapers, and there was the the London Times. We used to receive one copy of it, and one of the prisoners used to read it. So after this person would read it, it goes around to and 200 other people would read it. So he asked me for newspapers, magazines, money, and clothes. So I used to hide them in this trash can, and he would go and retrieve them. Matt, I'm afraid I don't have any more questions, and I don't know if the panel may have some questions, but one a, it's a wonderful, wonderful way of contextualizing um, the, the, all the comings and the happenings before the 2011 and the 2013. So thank you so much. Thank you so much. Yes, I have a question here. Thank you for reminding us in such clear and passionate terms of Syria's uh, recent uh, history and of the damage caused by dictator dictatorship. And uh, I think that you were right to point out that the regime's repressions has affected not only journalists, but all Democrats. Uh, in your po from your perspective, how we could define the form of government of the regime in Syria? a dictatorship of a family or military, military dictatorship or a dictatorship of the police force and of the various branches of the secret service. Obviously, obviously, they, these powers are strictly linked and they work together. But I would like to know who, in your opinion, as now a dominant position in the regime's power block, who is who has more power and who is now more hostile to the free press? And the last question, what are the international ties that strengthen the regime? Thank you for this very important question. You are paving the way for me to just empty everything I want to say. Hafez al-Assad built an individual dictatorship. So a military individual dictatorship. There are no election, no democratic powers, and no social movement in this dictatorship. He is a military person, and he brought a military regime. He built a family regime 
it's the regime of the Assad family. Before that, Hafez al-Assad and Rifat al-Assad used to govern us, and now Bashar al-Assad, Maher al-Assad, and the rest of the family are governing us. The rest are all servants. All the rest are uh, servants being paid. They uh, receive orders and they execute them. They cannot say no. No officer, no head of branch can say no. The security apparatus is just like a ring in the finger of uh, the regime. It, uh, the regime removes it when it wants and puts it back when it wants. Any officer in the army or any high-ranked uh, official uh, have allegiance to this person and not to Syria. The allegiance is the, uh, to the president, previously Hafez al-Assad and now to Bashar al-Assad. So it's God and next to God there's Bashar and that's it. The regime is a dictatorship, a violent dictatorship. It does not have any values. It does not have any standards, like uh, democratic standards. Killing is something very n normal, and detention is very normal. Humiliating Syrian people, uh, normal people, civilians and, and politicians is something normal. Imagine that there are no free syndicates and unions in Syria. There are uh, syndicates that are affiliated to the party and execute the policy of the party. There are no youth movements also. Only movements uh, based on the, uh, the party. The party executes the orders of the uh, president. Everyone who goes, strays away is ousted. The, 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 the external powers, the external state that strengthen the regime, in your opinion, if you... To be honest, and I would like you to know this, the regime is a local regime. However, it has international relationships, international relations that are very deep and strong. Unfortunately, a part of Europe and uh, the European left uh, supports the regime of Bashar al-Assad and supported Hafez al-Assad. Madeleine Albright is the one who brought Bashar al-Assad. She blessed uh, his, him taking power and gave him the uh, keys uh, to Syria. This, this is uh, Madeleine Albright, the Secretary of State who died recently. She has pictures with Bashar al-Assad. 24 hours after the death of Hafez al-Assad, she, so Madeleine Albright came and gave Bashar al-Assad the keys to Syria. So Bashar al-Assad gave these, uh, took these keys and uh, did whatever he wanted. Uh, the international relations. So I would like to hear to explain to Europeans the specificity of Syria. Syria is not the, the Assad family. There are 23 million Syrians who live, who dream of uh, freedom, of democracy, of the, 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 the sovereignty of a state, just like any other human being. We don't want violence. We don't want killing. We don't want blood. We want a citizen state, a state uh, with uh, diversity, with several, uh, with several parties, with. Uh, uh, journalism, free journalism, who all work for to build Syria. The Europeans supported this regime, and today, ten years later, ten years after the, the ignition of the war, uh, when the regime fought the people, where the regime used tanks to uh, silence the people, some European countries and some European uh, companies are still helping the regime despite the sanctions. There are Belgian companies who are exporting to the regime the, the raw material to produce sarin and uh, toxic uh, uh, chemicals that, that they used to, to bomb Syrians. There are investigations about this. There are companies from other companies such as Denmark. They are providing the regime with uh, kerosene for planes, and these planes are bombing the Syrians. Uh, what is the, this is double standards. The policy of the European Union is clear. We are against oppression and against what happened in Syria, and they are afraid also uh, of uh, the change. The Europeans and the Americans are afraid that the revolution would lead the, to the Islamists taking power in Syria. 
Ladies and gentlemen, this is not a reality. The Islamist or the Islamist ideology is only 5% of the Syrians. The Muslim Brothers, which is the strongest uh, organization in the Middle East when it comes to the Islamists, has only 10,000 to 20,000 persons only. But what about the, the remaining 23 million people in Syria? Why does the West look at Syria that and says that uh, after the change will lead to an Islamist state? No, this is not true. The Syrians will not accept this. The Syrians are people who love life. Syrians love good food. Syrians love to go out on a stroll, on a picnic. They like to dress nicely. They like to wear perfume. I am one of these people, and these are our values. This is how we were raised, and this is how my father was raised, and my grandfather was raised, and this is how I am raising my son. We love life. We don't want to fight. The West is wrong if they think that the Syrian will, Syrians will accept an Islamist state such as ISIS or Nusra Front or any other Islamist organization. No, these are just, uh, play, uh, they have small places in Syria. They are not the base in Syria. 95% of the Syrian people believe in social justice and democracy and in life. They love life. They only want to live, produce and leave. And they don't even want any help from the state. The state, the government can uh, provide education, basic service and infrastructure. So what I want to do is work, produce and I contribute with the state by, to the state by paying taxes. So the Europeans and the Americans are wrong here. And in the Middle East, there are some regional powers that, are, that want the regime to stay and it's in, in their interest for the regime to stay. And now Russia has used 16 vetoes in the Security Council so the regime would not be sanctioned. The regime used chemical weapons, used sarin in, um, and uh, VX to kill uh, Syrians in Ma'arat Naman and Khan Shaykhun and others. There are chemical massacres. Why wasn't this tackled by the, the uh, Security Council? The ICC is closed uh, before the Syrians. The Security Council is closed for us. Russia and China use 16 vetoes to protect uh, the government. Unfortunately, there are countries that uh, say that they are democratic countries, such as India and others. They are supporting the regime and they are uh, standing by its side uh, with any international resolution. The Human Rights Council, unfortunately, Russia is is in the uh, was in the Human Rights Council, and they were protecting the regime. So the international relations uh, are strong for the Syrian regime. So the Middle East is in turmoil. Your relationship has to be with the Syrian people and the representative of the people, and not the regime. This regime is fake, and it will it will always be fake. The, the people is the one that will live, uh, that will live and survive and will uh, be vict victorious at the end. The Westerners use democracy as a way and it, 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 it's used to its uh, pretext for bloodbath. That's it. Thank you. Is there a question from the May I just add the... I'm sorry. Just uh, more than a question is that, um, well, I, I thank you for saying what uh, you, you just said. Perhaps we should remind all of us that uh, little before 2011, little before the um, Assad regime was uh, uh, casted in, in the West as a as a dictatorship, etc., and only until the year before or a few months before, um, some Western power used to send prisoners, unofficial prisoners, as the extraordinary rendition to Syria and to other countries, but in, now we are talking about Syria, uh, in order to do what was then a dirty job that the West did, or the Americans didn't want to do, uh, the, the United States didn't want to do by themselves. So perhaps um, uh, this is not a question, this is just a comment, but perhaps this is something that we should bear in mind uh, when we talk, as you did now, of uh, double standards. Uh, and well, this is. Thank you. I just have one remark. 
the regime has ties, security ties with Europeans and non-Europeans. We, we all agree about this. When the U.S. wants to uh, investigate, uh, wanted to interrogate uh, some prisoners from Guantanamo, they sent them to Syria to extract uh, a, a confession from them. With waterboarding and uh, others, there are 71 ways of torture in Syria that were used in Syria. These ways of torture were used against everyone, international prisoners and the local prisoners. There's a, a Syrian guy, a Canadian, Syrian Canadian guy called. He was uh, he he is he was an engineer, and he used to live in Canada. And his wife was Canadian. So a report came from one of the countries saying that he is a terrorist, and he was extradited to Syria, where he was detained for three years. Canada extradited him to Syria, and then this, his case is known. And then a while later, uh, Canada retrieved him, so asked the, the regime to uh, give it, uh, give him back to her, uh, to the, the dam, sorry. So uh, he was returned to Canada, and uh, they uh, apologized to him. And eventually, this report and this accusation, it turned out that it was false, and they had to pay him a reparation. Maher Arab uh, wrote a book about what he saw and what he witnessed in Syrian prisons. So lots of... So the, lots of Syrian um, uh, apparatus, the security apparatus in Syria, they use, uh, um, so, the, sorry, the international uh, community sometimes use the, use the Syrian regime in order to do their the work for them. And some people wanted the Syrian regime to stay because of this security file. And what we say, the Syrian people has to say in order to build a secular state, a democratic state, we are not a terrorist state. We, the Syrian people are not terrorists. There are rare cases of Syrians who were uh, detected with uh, terrorist uh, uh, accusations. But these are very rare, rare cases. It's rare that Syrians would cause problems. Syrian people are simple people. They don't like violence. There are other people maybe who like violence or who like terrorism. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I don't think we have any more questions. We've, we've uh, heard a lot from you, but thank you very much. Shukra.